How did you move from traditional finance to crypto? So crypto was a hobby. It caught up with me because it became huge in 2016, 2017. So you started Tezos in 2014. Tezos allowed to be Tezos come from the first Tezos place. is a block. As yeah. a hobby? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Arthur Brightman, AI and mathematics prodigy, the founder of Tezo. The concern at some point is more like the AI itself, getting to intelligence levels where, in comparison, the human being is an ant. We've seen very credible people come out and say that actually they are concerned about threats to humanity from AI. My number one fear is like, forget about even preventing this. How do you even convince people that there's a problem? If the technology is any good, it's going to become less and less relevant to know how to use it. A lot of people will end up without any job. I'm less concerned about that, not because it's not concerning, but because I've been on carnivore diets, keto diets, all of these different types of diets. For some people, it makes a huge difference, especially like people who have depression, for example, that can make very big differences to them. What's the downside of that? So basically, it can be hard to... Uh... Yeah, yeah, I moved to London in uh, February 2019. Okay, wh why? Um, I wanted to be close to France because I was uh, working with a um, company in France called Nomadic Labs. They're working um, actively uh, on the Tizos protocol. And I wanted to be close to uh, I wanted to be close to friends, but at the same time, uh, my wife is American. She's not a French speaker. We wanted to be in an English speaking country, uh, and London was uh, attractive. It's also we've um, you know we met in New York, and I I lived for over a decade in New York, and I would say London is the closest thing to New York outside of uh, outside of uh, New York. Is there not an age at a certain age at which you want a more I don't want to say peaceful life, but like places where you are able to experience kind of like the you know energy and kind of madness of the place but also you're able to chill for example in hong kong i found it very difficult you know or even in mm. london i mean you can go to the countryside yeah obviously but or for you it's really i want to be in this like high energy life non-stop because that's what drives me and excites me that the latter the latter I, you know i think that's what they say is the, diff the real difference between extrovert and introvert is like what is your source of energy and my source of energy is more interacting with people uh uh, being exposed to all these ideas. Now, the internet takes the place of a lot of that in some mm -hmm. sense. Like I'm getting a lot of more interactions online than I used to 10 years ago. So in some sense, I think it makes it more possible to be uh, a, a little away from uh, uh, from from cities. But but still, I, I think it's there's no uh, it's not a, a full substitute to in-person interactions. And so, you know, know very much how you'd like to be near uh, uh, centers of uh, of innovation and centers of uh, of, uh, of activity. How important do you think this human acts aspect and human connection is, is actually? Because we think more and more, you know, with all this internet and devices that this is becoming the new world. We talk about, you know, metaverse and there's even like Lex Friedman who had this podcast with, uh, with Mark Zuckerberg in yeah, the metaverse yeah. and all. But like the actual, is there one day where this is really be going to become, replace fully this actual interaction or it's just impossible? And impossible to replicate. I mean, you know, uh, proof, there's a proof of existence. At some point, you, you plug something in your brain, and, and if you are like physically, you know, if you like, if none of your senses can tell the difference, and clearly at some point you get there, the question is like, you know, how far is it? How, how good does the technology have to be to be? Uh, and it's not never going to be a full substitute un until you get to uh, to that point. But it can be good enough at some point. Uh, I personally, I'm not a, I'm not really a fan of uh, of the uh, the experiences that that. People are doing with uh, um, with headsets. I mean, no, mm. it's it's fine as an experiment, but what I'm saying is like I find it cumbersome. I uh, I I think the sweet spot is either in a video call or in an in person, and like the the kind of embodiment you get through through VR is still not like it's still not good enough that it's something that it's the type of experience that I that I'd be uh, interested in. What do I need to understand about? your early context to understand the Arthur sitting in front of me today in this podcast studio in London? Well, I don't know. This is, <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things, but, uh, I mean, I've always been you know, like, I've always, I've always been pretty, um, individualistic in my, uh, in, in my thought and philosophy for, uh, for a long time. So I would say that's, uh, that's pretty deep seated. How, how was your childhood like? Uh, I would think pretty normal, uh, you know, like pretty happy, regular uh, childhood. I mean, I don't like. To, I'm not saying that having a happy childhood is necessarily the norm, but like as far as you yeah. know, like happy childhoods goes, there's nothing. Uh, 
uh, nothing absolutely uh, extraordinary about my uh, my, uh, my my childhood. Uh, I was an early child, and uh, I didn't you know like school initially, uh, mostly because I just like didn't really fit in. Uh, I went to Magnet High School later in life, and that was a much better experience. What would you say I didn't fit in? Well, with the other kids, I, I didn't get along with all of the other kids. People, so, yeah. okay. That's really interesting because would you say you were bullied? Oh, yeah, had, yeah, absolutely. Because, because we had Jordi Alexander uh, yeah. that we released basically this week, and he talked about the fact that he was basically a perfect target for bullying. Yeah. Because he was the, and he said it's not the person who is, uh, you know, the most weird or antisocial. It's more the person who is kind of too cool for school or doesn't really fit in that is kind of the target for that. And he was actually, he, it's what happened to him. Yeah, no, I mean, it was, it, it was a combination of like, I would dress differently. Uh, you know, I had like uh, corduroy pants and, uh, you know, button shirts. Okay. Uh, this type of things. And uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would say I was also probably like pretty arrogant. Uh, not that it would justify the type of physical violence I was subjected to. Uh, but, you know, uh, <laughs> definitely. Uh, Where would you say this arrogance was coming from? Um... I would uh, probably as a reaction to being to being it's like you know I think it fits into each other right they don't like you and so you know you, they don't you, you get rejected they don't like you and so you like you, you fall back and you say like no no actually and uh, it actually uh, forges in, in parts your uh, your identity as a, as a defense is it also because you think I was also very short like I ah. I, I grew like a, I grew like a foot when I was in uh, uh, at the end of high school and what happened afterwards because you were Fairly tall. Now. No, I'm tall now, but like I, I was among the shortest in my class, you know, like until the age of like 17 and then like 17 to 19, I just grew a bunch. Okay. So it changes the, it changes the dynamic. Also, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I think it was like um, pretty poor at uh, uh, pretty poor at sports in general. Because, because you didn't like size. it or because you were not good at it? Both. It fits Both. into each other, you know. <laughs> For my <laughs> well, you're not passionate about, you're probably not going to be the best about it. <laughs> <That's laughs> Do you think you felt that you're smarter than people around you from an early age? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, probably. Is it because people would tell you or is it because like of just you were realizing, man, I understand this thing, like these people don't understand. I know how to read the clock very early on. I know how to do all these, you know. No, I was super bad at reading with... clocks, actually. <laughs> <laughs> super slow at that. <laughs> so, you know, if anything, uh, the, the clock would have been an indication that... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I might have something wrong with it. To this day, you know, I, uh, I, the, the hand mechanism is uh, is weird. Hence, the, I don't know how old, how no, old I weird. am from before. <laughs> yes, exactly. See, it's so impressive. Uh, but no, I mean, you know, so like you, it's cool. You get graded, right? You know, it's like every week you get graded and uh, you get a sense of things because it's instilled in you by, by the... So always good grades, system. top grades. Yeah. You said you also play music, right? Instruments. It's yeah. something you started early on. Yeah, so I mean, you know, like like many children, uh, I was uh, I was put in front of a of a, of a piano and said like you know like and, and like given some lessons to try to pick up the uh, the instrument. I did about like five years when I was a child, um, and I was pretty mediocre. Uh, to give you an idea of how nerdy I am, like just how bad it is, I got bullied when I was sent to music music camp. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> like the music camp kids thought I was too nerdy for them. Um, what do you mean by too nerdy? I mean, you know, it's like, you know, I, I think when it was the, the, the photo, uh, the class photo day, like when I'm like, I don't know, maybe nine or so, I showed up in a, you know, I showed up in a white shirt with a, with a tie. Okay. Mind you, my parents were not so, encouraging any of this. this is wow. All, this is all me. <laughs> uh, Where do you think it comes from? Like you just see, ah, uh, you just see some examples. I want to follow this example. Or you're just thinking I need to look perfect or? Defiance, like, I think. Did, 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 I mean, part of it is that. Uh, Part of it is I, I, I liked it, and part of it was also like, uh, y y you know, like I know they're not, I, I know the other kids are not gonna like it, and <laughs> so I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I want to provoke something, a reaction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, no, I didn't want to provoke a reaction, but like I, uh, I also wanted to. It's more about drawing lines and like asserting, uh, and uh, it's about being assertive more than anything. But so, like, yeah, so I, I played the piano when I was a kid for about five years, and uh, I, w I was mediocre at it, and so I didn't like it. A lot of things came easily to me, this did not. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't really uh, 
like so I, maybe like from seven to twelve or something like that. I, yeah, I practiced, and I started again picking it up during the pandemic. Okay, and the huge the huge difference that has like happened in the meantime is that I grew uh, I, I I I grew okay with the idea that I could enjoy doing it even if I wasn't good at it, which is a you know I'm not uh, this this like trying to enjoy it for its own sake as opposed to do it like for the sake of competition was very it, it's something that took me a very long time to uh, uh, to get like mentally uh, good with so it's sort of a, almost a meditation yeah exactly it's extremely meditative that's mm. that's why I do it now I agree I also play music piano and I think it's one of the best meditation out there you can do just with your piano and yeah oh, absolutely love it so you went to New York for, so after high, high school, right? Yeah. What did you do there? I went to, after engineering school, I went to New York. Um, okay. Yeah, I wanted to work in finance. I wanted to, uh, to, to do machine learning in finance. And, uh, Why? Because I like both. I was interested in finance uh, from a young age. I got to the first, I, I think I visited New York when I was nine. And like the one thing I wanted to do absolutely was visit the New York Stock Exchange. Okay. Uh, and, uh, I was also interested in machine learning. Uh, I would say that came later. Uh, but I, yeah, I got this interest in machine learning and statistics around like beginning of high school is when I started getting interested in that. Um, what did you do? Like uh, online search or actual classes about that? Or like, how did you approach this whole thing? Especially given it's, wh when is that? Um, I would say I get really interested into the topic in 1988, 1999. Wow. Okay. Uh, and I just like try to pick up books at the uh, library, read the books, program a little bit, see what's uh, see what's out there. I do, I do some. Uh, How much was out there back then? Um, I didn't get the internet until late, like until 1999, uh, which I would say it's late considering, you know, like the lens I was going to, to try to access it from the library and, and all of that. Um, but yeah, I was lacking resources and mostly I also was lacking a lot of, uh, of guidance. I didn't really have any like mentors or people I could turn to, to really, uh, to really help with this, uh, with this learning. And it changes a bit in 1999. I, uh, I, I started getting like meeting more people who could teach me some stuff. And then I got into competitive programming, uh, and did a few competitions. Maybe a parenthesis on that because it's so important because machine learning, AI, especially with what happened, you know, with ChatGPT Chat in yeah. the last year, uh, it's been a year now already. Yeah, yeah, but a year. It's been a year already. It's, it's actually been three. Three years? Well, GPT-3 came out in 2020. And, uh, but that uh, people started to really like realize, oh man, there's this thing that we can use and it's really I know, but interesting it, and amazing. I know, but, but two things happen. One is like the model got better between 2020 and 2022. 20, uh, Clearly, the model got better. Mm. And they gave it a chat interface. And yeah. I would say like 90% of what happened is they gave it a chat interface. Yeah. Like, what was everyone thinking? You know, it's just uh, it's weird because the technology was, is there, was there for years. So our previous guest, Jordi Alexander, we ended the, the podcast talking about kind of the dangers of AI. Yeah. And he's a very optimistic person, but he was saying, I was asking like, where do we end up with that? And he was saying something like, the scary thing is that at some point, the difference between the person A and B mm -hmm. could be deep, could be bigger than the difference between a, the person B and the pet because yeah. of AI. What do you think about that? Well, I, I don't know. Why would AI make one person different? Because one person knows how to use AI. Oh. And, and the other one basically is not catching up with that, right? So today we have, let's say, a person B and a pet, which like, okay, you, yeah. you, you love this pet and you take care of it. But like there is clearly kind of a, a difference between both. And what he's saying is that person A who really understands AI or, yeah. or these companies who are basically in control of this, mm. the difference with a person B could be even bigger than the B with the pet, right? In terms of right. like the advancement and the understanding and that a lot of people, basically all these B people mm -hmm. will basically end up without any job. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm less concerned about that, which not because it's not concerning, but because I have great bigger, concern, <laughs> bigger concerns. What are these uh, bigger the, concerns the about concern AI? The concern is not so much, you know, for me between like someone with AI versus someone not with AI. You know, and if anything, you know, if the, if the technology is any good in some sense, 
it, it's going to become less and less relevant to know how to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, fundamentally, it it, it it doesn't matter. The whole point is like the technology. If, if you have something that's smart, it can do things without actually needing uh, much of your help. So I don't think that is happening. What does happen, though, is um, I, I, I do think it's going, it, it, can, it can push up um, economic inequalities. Uh, I just say, you know, like, first order effect is that it's going to make a lot of things a lot cheaper. So I would say probably raise standards of living. Mm. It is, it does, um, it does, I think, push inequality because overall, uh, you know, if you have something that's like a perfect, a perfect substitute for labor, uh, then, the, then the value of labor falls uh, down a lot. And so the difference between someone who has like, I have, you know, capital versus like, I just have my labor, mm. the relative value of the labor actually, uh, I think falls, uh, falls quite a bit. So we can see some of that, uh, but at the same time, right, with massively raised standards of living, um, that's one thing. So what's the problem there? I understand the raising inequality, but if if it's for people to have their their standard uh, living standard raised, yeah, is there not something good? Well, you, you I mean, is there not? Yeah. Is it not a, a kind of like the benefits outweighing the the costs of that? Okay, so, so usually. Uh, um, at least since the industrial revolution, right? We are in a position where the supply of labor is not extremely elastic in a sense of like, if you have, if, if, if you can have more than a subsistence wage, it doesn't mean that people say like, oh, wow, now that we can have more than a subsistence wage, you know, let's have as many kids as possible until basically the wage is exactly what it costs to not die of starvation, right? So there are periods of history where basically like all economic gain is just absorbed by population growth. And at some point that stops. Uh, but when you have the, the, the difference is that like a lot of the labor that gets substituted by AI, this is very elastic in the sense of like if the AI is producing more labor output, more value than it costs to make more chips, then you just start making more chip. And so you, you're looking at a society which is spending a lot of money uh, uh, on like energy and, uh, and chip manufacturing. Mm. Uh, so that's, uh, but but the, the the bigger concern I would say is not person A with AI versus person B. The bigger concern at some point is more like the AI itself, having you know getting to intelligence levels where in comparison a uh, human being is an ant, and ants are not very good at controlling humans. And at some point I would say humans lose control of the uh, future of humanity, which just ends up being uh, like determined by some of the systems. How do we prevent that from happening? Is it even possible? To prevent es it? Yeah. Especially because, again, we talked about that with Jordi. We, people, you know, there's regulations, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem I see, even without talking about AI, just with social media and Facebook, the people who decide on these regulations, you look at uh, the Congress, like they didn't really even understand social media. They were asking questions that were completely, mm -hmm. you know, that they made no sense. So if these people are the people who are, kind of defining regulations yeah. and they don't even understand social media, how mm. do they define the right and regulations when it comes to AI, which is much more complicated? Yeah, so I've been thinking about, so I've been thinking in general about AI existential risk for like since roughly, I would say 2009, 2000, 2010. And, you know, for a while it was more of a distance prospect because it, 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 it wasn't like, very rapid progress in the field. And then we st we start seeing really rapid progress happen, I would say. For me, the biggest moment was 2020 with the release of GPT-3. So mm. we see this very fast progress happen. And my like my number one fear is like, you know, forget about like even preventing this. How do you even convince people that there's a problem? Mm. Because it was a very, very fringe position, yeah. uh, existential risk from AI. And what I think has been a very positive surprise since 20, uh, 2021, 2022, is that first we've seen very credible people come out and say that actually they are concerned about uh, credible uh, about threats from uh, 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 to humanity from from AI. We've had um, uh, Yusha Benio and uh, Jeffrey Hinton. Mm. They are two thirds of the three people who won um, the Turing Award for uh, deep learning. And then we have Yann Lequin, who's actually saying that it's not a concern at all. Because it will be built, because the people who build it will build it correctly. Mm. Which you know, if you think it can be built correctly, that's great news. But um, I would say there hasn't been a lot of concrete plans uh, proposed for for building AI that's actually uh, like 
very, very powerful AI systems which are safe. And to be clear, I don't think any of the systems that we have today represent this massive risk. Uh, I'm just looking at the growth curve and where's it going to be in like three or five years. What's the kind of tipping point or moment where it becomes risky? You know, it goes from one direction to another. My, my question linked to that is, is it good for companies to be private doing that or mm -hmm. not? Because yeah. private companies have kind of like their own potentially like a, a shorter term, you know, thinking. Yeah. And if they think that way, they're less going to think about, you know, like what's going to happen in 10 or 20 years. Like we're going to make more money and more profit now. And therefore we're going to think about now. And at some point you have to make this decision. Like they think about the long-term consequences mm -hmm. or, the, the, or, or not. Right. It might mean contradiction with making money. So there's good news and bad news here. Uh, in uh, the, 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 the good news is that I think the, the risks are in the short term. I think we have like very serious risk in the next five to, five, five to 10 years. Uh, and uh, they affect everyone. So you don't, have a, you don't have a bit of a prisoner's dilemma. You know, if you look at something like, uh, uh, I don't know, global warming, for example, everyone might say like, oh, well, it might be a problem in 50 years. But mm -hmm. number one, you know, like maybe that's not going to be my problem. And number two, uh, if I don't do it, someone else will do it. So I might as well profit from it now. Whereas, you know, in the case of like imminent AI risk, uh, basically every, everyone is incentivized in the right way to not do that. So the only fact, it's not really a factor of like the game theory of it. It's more about uh, how, like, how convinced are people that those risks are real and worth uh, addressing. That's 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 the main factor. It's really about like I think if tomorrow everyone on Earth wakes up and is like, "Yep, I'm 100% convinced that if we don't change the course, uh, this is going to be a problem," then it gets solved. That there's no coordination failure. I think that that that's all that 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 that, that prevents it. It's just like a, it's I really it's really a matter of advocacy and like people understanding why the risk exists and and what's the nature of the risk. So if you have to think about the two potential places where we might end up, what are those? Like the the, the optimistic, positive future and the negative one what do they look like right um there's a there's a graph actually that that shows you like four type of uh, four types of uh, a future for ai so okay. and, I, and i like it and so one is uh the, the, the first i would say decision point is do you get something resembling a technological singularity or not right and and then is it positive or negative Wait, do you want to develop that if you have to yeah. explain that to your grandmother uh <laughs> <laughs> well, the idea of a technological singularity is that, you know, you see technological progress happen and um, over human history, it's happened progressively faster and faster. So we have very long periods where the standards of living and the type of life that people are living doesn't change very, very quickly. Um, if you look at that, some, you know, how someone may be living in 1800 versus in, you know, 1600, over 200 years, you don't have like a massive amount of change. And if you look at the amount of change we've had in 10 years, 20 years, it's much, much faster. And the question is what happens if you have so much technological progress that happens in a very, very short period of time. So that's the idea of a technological singularity where everything is like radically transformed. And if you look at the type of technology that's possible, just now hasn't been developed, and you assume that all this technology becomes available uh, right away, mm -hmm. uh, you have like a fundamentally transformed uh, view of the world or the universe. And, you know, you might imagine like what happens once we have molecular nanotechnology, what happens when we have molecular nano assemblers, uh, which can, uh, in minutes, you know, double their, the size of their, of their stock. Uh, you get, you know, very weird interest rates, for example, you get, like, it's not even, maybe it doesn't even make sense to talk about interest rate, but like productivity and growth just becomes radically different. Mm. So that's a singularity. A positive one is, uh, I would say one that's aligned with uh, what people uh, would like in life. So, you know, like striving on human life, people are people are generally happy and pleased with it and uh, human values are being embodied. Uh, so that's great. Uh, it's it, Even though it's great, it's also uh, a little bit scary to think about. I mean, you know, by definition, a positive singularity is, is positive, right? So you can't really think of like, oh, but is it negative in a certain sense? Nope. If you have, if it's positive and you have all the technology to make it as good as it as it can be, then it's positive. Mm. But it's weird because, and I'm going to tie this to uh, to my piano practice. <laughs> One of the reasons I'm doing my piano practice while being bad at it is like, it's about, uh, sorry, not, not bad, I'm mediocre. It's, uh, it's about being able to enjoy uh, 
the thing for its own sake, as opposed to trying to achieve anything. And I think basically, like once you get past the technolog technological singularity, that's all you have left. Like you can't, you can't find fulfillment in achievement. Everything becomes a hobby, and that's a little scary to to, to consider, if, even on a positive thing. Saying like, well, you know, I think we try to find meaning in building things in uh, uh, in these accomplishments, and if there's nothing you can accomplish that is of any important meaning or value, it's you have to basically just uh, accept the experiences uh, for their own sake. That's really interesting because people, a lot of people on this podcast talk about finding the meaning in achievement and the happiness in the achievements. Right? Yeah. But if you look at kind of more normal people or even spiritual people, it's actually in the very simple things in life that you find the meaning and the happiness and the happiness can never come from the achievements, because every time you achieved something, mm. you need the next one. Otherwise, you kind of lost your drive, right? Yeah. yeah. So how did you, because you said that with the, the piano, you, it's a good example. How can someone move from one to the other saying, oh, this is, I'm pursuing that just for, you know, the achievement and then kind of like saying, no, actually, like I can do that as a hobby also and it can be very beneficial to me. Yeah. Uh, I think oh, it's you, more like something wisdom that you develop with time. Yeah, I guess I, I mean, uh, for me it was like, I, I don't want to say like, oh yes, I, I, I sat at one point and I said like, how can I find more meaning in my life? And, uh, but it's just like, it, it, you know, I was, I was practicing it during the pandemic and it kind of dawned upon me that this is like, oh, actually what I'm doing is, is this and trying to focus on the experience as opposed to, uh, like being very competitive or driven to build something, you know, there's not like, uh. It's an internal goal. It's not an external goal. You've been thinking a lot about the meaning of life. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the problem is like, I don't, okay, so I've been thinking about the question about the meaning of life. Mm. And I would say the main problem that that we have, but it's, uh, the, the main problem is like fundamentally, we, we could care about two things and we don't care about either of those things exactly. If it could be that our goal as human beings, like, you know, we were born and we have this, we have, we, we have these goals that are either like innate or, 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 or get forms through our lives. But at, at, at one point we, we, we end up like wanting some things. And what we want is neither an internal experience, a pure internal experience, because if you offer people something like an experience machine where you say like, look, I'll give you a hallucination and you'll hallucinate exactly what you want, or I'll just like poke your reward center and you all the reward in your brain, like, oh, no, no, I don't want this. You want something real, mm -hmm. right? You want something real. You don't just want the impression of something real. So we're not looking for purely inner reward, but we're also not looking for, like, imposing, we're not looking for an external property, uh, for an external state of the world. We don't want to say, like, oh, I just want the world to be, like, a certain way. And if that happens, I'll be, I'll be happy. Uh, case in point, for example, uh, imagine that, you know, if, 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 I put you through like this kind of teleporter that just like creates another version of you and I don't destroy the first version. Uh, and then I say to the first version, well, sorry, you know, now I have to destroy you. You wouldn't be happy. And you can say, well, why wouldn't you be happy? You're fine. There's someone else who has exactly the same goals as you. And so those goals are going to be carried out. And so you should be fine. And like, no, because I don't just want these external goals to be reached or this an external state of the world to be reached. I actually want to experience it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's neither pure experience, not pure, not pure external goals, and fundamentally it means we can't get what we want, and you know it just like creates a bunch of paradoxes that 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 we don't have either of those things, and so we we fundamentally cannot be satisfied. So once you understood that it's a bunch of paradoxes, how did you navigate that or change a few things, or you just accepted that, or you said, oh, this is how I'm going to kind of change my life to make it more kind of meaningful and eventually become happier. Not, not purely, but the, the, the thing is like, I don't, I don't even, I don't necessarily think we also want to become happier and, you know, just like, why? Uh, Cause it's just like one aspect, you know, being happy is just one aspect of life. There's other things. What are the about. others? And also like, it's, it's not just about being, not being happier. It's like, you, you don't want to, you know, you don't necessarily want to, to change what makes you happy. Like, you know, if I. If I if I offered you tomorrow, take a pill, and then I would say everything will make you happy. 
you probably would miss, you'd not, not, you might not necessarily want that because you care about those things. So you want to be ha- you're not just looking to be happy. Again, you're not just looking for the inner reward. You want to be lo- you want to be happy because it's a reflection on desirable properties of the world that uh, that, that that you're looking for. So it's tough. Like idea, you know, if I could, I would try to like modify myself as as little as possible, but to nudge myself in the in the direction of like caring more about the state of the world than my experience of it. Mm. But it's tough. Because you think that your impact on the state of the world is eventually what's going to make you happier than kind of like focusing on yourself, right? I, I think mean, people in general. I think if you care about the state of the world, it's uh, it's it's uh, then your experience of it. It's a lot uh, easier to cope with mortality, for example. Mm. Because you can create systems, institutions, or whatever that can carry out those goals, as opposed to like fundamentally having to experience them. Mm. But, but 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 then again, I'm doing the piano, and that's the opposite of that. <laughs> the whole point is like, no, I'm actually focusing on internal experience. So I don't know. It's very, uh, it's very frustrating. I don't. I I, I don't think we're, we're we're capable as a species of having a coherent uh, answer or satisfactory answer to uh, to the question of. Uh, uh, of the meaning of life. Do you believe that uh, when people say ignorance is bliss? Yeah. So basically, the less you think, the happier you're going to be. Because when you start to think about everything, you know, like you realize yeah. actually like it's almost impossible and like that might just make you less happy. Yeah, in right, your, ignorance is bliss, but I, I don't think everyone is motivated just by bliss. <laughs> so let's get back to um, New York. Yeah. Finance. Yeah. So first job in finance. Yeah. What did you do? Actually, no. My first job in New York was um, so I was going to uh, I did my master's in uh, in financial math in uh, in New York, and during the day I was working for a uh, for a small startup. Okay. Uh, doing semantic web. What is that? Uh, the idea of the semantic web was that you would annotate different parts of uh, of the web with uh, web pages with micro formats, so things like RSS or uh, RDF. Mm-hmm. So let's say you have uh, a shopping website, you would have like little structured information about each item. Uh, and it would make it easier after that for like large search engines or other applications to go through this page and like have something that was machine readable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it turns out that after you know uh, uh, thirteen uh, f- sorry twenty five so af- after twenty years it was actually easier to solve artificial intelligence than it was to get anyone to put structured data on their website. <laughs> like we na- we now like have completely solved natural language understanding. And we can generate those microformats using AI. That was easier than convincing people to adopt the semantic web, uh, which is crazy to think about. Uh, so I, I did that, but, but quickly then I, uh, I started working uh, as an intern for um, Neiman Brothers at okay. first, and then a few hedge funds. What did you do there? Uh, statistical arbitrage was uh, the, main, the main thing I got into. What is that concretely in the world of finance, statistical arbitrage? Yeah, so the idea of statistical arbitrage is when you find statistical patterns of price discrepancies, mm-hmm. which uh, where the signal is strong enough that you know that they're going to recur. They don't recur for sure, but statistically they should happen. And then you put on uh, trades uh, in, uh, in in public markets where which um, basically let you profit from these statistical discrepancies. This is all made automatically? This is all made automatically, So yeah. this is the high-frequency trading... Not necessarily. So, so some startup is low frequency. Uh, some people will do startup and like rotate their position every quarter. Um, you know, like you could notice statistically that say, oh wow, uh, uh, you know, stocks with uh, low PE and uh, high uh, uh, low PE and uh, and low PEG and like you could do the different indicators tend to tend to overperform other stocks. And then every quarter you do, you build a, a long short portfolio of that. So that's that's one model of startup. That's probably the lower lowest frequency type of startup. And then you have startup also that takes place on like a, a day long type of horizon, minute long, or even sometimes you know like second or microsecond long. So how long do you do that for? Uh, well, I really would say I started in 20, 2006. Actually, I was also working a little bit as an intern. So like internships and such, like starting two thousand four. I full time job started in uh, two thousand seven, and I did it until um, twenty sixteen. How affected were you by the great financial crisis? Well, I mean, I, I just started with a great financial crisis, so I, I joined a startup hedge fund at the time, who obviously didn't raise as much money as they thought they were going to raise uh, mm-hmm. based on that. But 
other than that, I don't think it, uh, so it affected the prospect of this fund, but other than that, I don't think it affected me all that much. So you said until 2016, right? Until 2016. I, until 2016, yeah. But you started Tezos before that, 2014. I started working on Tezos in 2014. How did you do the move from traditional finance to crypto? What was your aha moment? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I didn't actually. I moved from traditional finance to robotics. So in 2016, I went to work for Waymo, which was uh, Alphabet's uh, self-driving core division. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it was part of Google X at the time, and then became Waymo. Uh, so I did this for a year and a half, uh, and then but the, the, the crypto was a hobby, uh, and it, you know it caught up with me because it became huge in uh, in 2016, 2017. So you started Tezos in 2014 as yeah. a hobby. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, uh, what was the goal? Like, why? Uh, why? It was interesting. Uh, so there it, was were, a, it was an intellectual challenge. It was an intellectual them. challenge, and people were wrong on the internet. So. So you put the. A white paper out there in 2014, mm -hmm. just as an intellectual challenge. It, the, the, so there was a position paper and a white paper, but generally speaking, I think for me, it was an opportunity to explore like topics around smart contracts, proof of stake, all of that. And I figured, you know, if it were just a hobby, maybe I would just like have written blog posts and so on and so forth. So I did, you know, hire a small team and put, uh, put money into building it. But I figured this is, uh, I looked at it as an option, essentially saying like, uh, this might be nothing, but at the minimum, it'll be an interesting calling. It'll be something interesting that I've done, you know? <laughs> uh, I don't know where it'll go, but it will be, uh, I will learn something doing this. You started that with your wife, 2014? No, my, uh, my wife, uh, I mean, she was, uh, she was, she was pregnant from the beginning, but she really, um, she really joined, I would say more full time in, uh, in 2016. Like that's when she became involved. Is it not super risky to build a business or company with your life partner for the relationship? Yeah, no, it's a risk, definitely. Uh, if things go poorly and, you know, things did, <laughs> did go poorly, like we had everything, uh, every problem thrown at us in, uh, in, in 2017. So it's definitely a risk, but there's also like a huge benefit, which is that, you know, I would say, especially if, if you know someone for, uh, there's a value of having known someone for a long time. Mm -hmm. Right, which, which can happen outside, of course, of a, of a marriage relationship. Some people start companies with people in them for 10 years, right? But uh, there's, a, there's a value of like really knowing the other person very well, knowing that you're compatible, uh, and in general, like spending a lot of time together. Mm -hmm. Is there a moment where the business or where te the project basically put so much strain on your relationship that you, you almost put the relationship at, at, at risk? Or no, never? of course. No, 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 of course, of course. It's like, it's extremely draining. And, you know, we went through like the most traumatic version of that possible where we were personally naming like six lawsuits. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a psychopath in Switzerland trying to bankrupt us. I mean, you know, it was like definitely the most pressure. Uh, <laughs> is I would say there's very few, you know, companies and startups that, that goes through like the type of uh, of pressure and uh, uh, plus plus being slandered in the press like for, for like, six months by uh, by readers. So mm. it's it's pretty up there. So you say you start 2014 as a kind of like hobby. 2016, yeah. what's the moment where you start to realize I should leave my job to go full into that? I, I didn't leave my job until uh, August 2017. Wow. And the Tizos Foundation raised $230 million <laughs> in July 2017. <laughs> I liked robotics. So... Wow, I, I really <laughs> wanted to work on self-driving cars. So, <laughs> so you still had a full-time job when you raised two hundred thirty-two million dollars for Tezos in two thousand seventeen. But I didn't. That's the thing. It's like it was a, it was a Tezos Foundation. So at the time, I had my job, loved my job. Uh, there was an interest in uh, in Tezos, and I was yeah. like, well, it would be nice if you know it, it launched and had a life of its own and so on and so forth. And so, you know, at, at, at the time I'm thinking like, well, you know, you know, like the, the, the model that Ethereum used to launch with the Swiss Foundation and so on and so forth is yeah. a good model. Let's see if we can do something like that. And so um, I go to Switzerland, uh, you know, meet, meet with the same lawyers that had like met with uh, with Ethereum uh, and, you know, and they propose this structure uh, with this external foundation. And essentially it, like the deal looks like, look, the, you know, they, 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 there is money, they launch a network. Uh, I'm making uh, I'm making a bit of money for myself as well because I'm selling the the, the company and the IP to uh, uh, to them. But basically, it lets the project have a life of its own, and I can focus on you know my uh, my interest uh, at the time, which is in AI and robotics. Then it become like a much larger you know fundraise, and it was like set up uh, set up for a much 
bigger hits and uh, and success. How did and it even happen? Like, I mean, there's probably no. If I do a, a comparison to, for example, music, I used to be a DJ for five years. I was doing some intros for like big DJ like Avicii, mm -hmm. and like the guy before being famous. They knew already he would become famous. My manager would tell me, oh, yeah, look, uh, we are in um, March 2010. The guy cost 3.5K euros to come for two hours. This summer is going to be 100K, right? Because everything is pre-programmed mm -hmm. in music, in every industry. Was it the same in crypto? Or is it more kind of like something that kind of a succession of a few things that went really well, like so, sort of luck that made this one of the biggest ICO ever. Like, how did this even happen? Um, I don't think there was a... I don't think it was programmed in any sense. Although, you know, like, I would say through like 27, 2017, I would say we had a sense of like what the... We had a sense of like what the outcome would be through like shortly shortly before. But, you know, the, the, the crypto markets crashed shortly after shortly after this anyway. So these things are extremely uh, volatile. I think the timing was uh, mm -hmm. uh, was a big factor. Uh, I think the idea resonated a lot with uh, uh, with people. This was at a time where Ethereum was under a lot of stress and they were under uh, uh, a lot of stress in terms of their, you know, the governance in terms of the smart contract security. And those are topics which were addressed in the Tezos paper in 2014. So mm. people all of a sudden are like, wow, this is extremely prescient. And that's really interesting. Uh, and it was a, f a few things. So like, for example, you could um, you could contribute to, uh, uh, to, to the foundation using Bitcoin from an exchange, which is not something that uh, other people would do. Other people would just make, make you know, like their contributions tradable tokens on, uh, on Ethereum. So little things like this, I think, made a difference as well. But I, so I would say like people like, so... The, 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 the value of the project and bought into the notion of decentralized governance and uh, uh, and what it could bring. So basically it was, what are the key problems with Ethereum? Oh, there is this project out there that yeah. sort of exists since three years. They seem to solve like a bunch of these. Therefore, like we should invest in that. And that's basically like the kind of like, kind of like spark in the beginning. And and, and what's important to note is like, this was not created in reaction to Ethereum. It's, it, it's being created around the same time as Ethereum. Mm -hmm. So Ethereum is mentioned, but it's like a very nascent project at the time. So it was not created like somehow to fix problems with Ethereum. It was created to fix problem, theoretical problems. That, that you anticipated that anticipated would, happen. would happen in yeah. general. Yeah. Uh, but because because it was just like such a, such a fit around the narratives at the time, a lot of people to this day think mm -hmm. that, oh yeah, Tezos was created in reaction to Ethereum doing this and that. No, 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 no. That was actually like, those were like just very good calls uh, early on. So kind of like, I don't know, almost accidentally, like this happens, 2000, so July, you say you raised 232 million in Bitcoin, ETH, USD. Uh, right? The Jesus Foundation raises 230 million in uh, uh, Bitcoin and ETH. Okay. How much of that was sold? Or all kept in Bitcoin and ETH? Because this is basically the perfect timing to raise money in crypto, Given how much is going to go up, you know, in the next six months? Uh, no, actually, in, in, uh, this is, happens in July. So, you know, actually, the 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 the, the crypto markets kind of like go down quite a bit uh, uh, after uh, after that, and and, and then and they pick then up again in December okay. and go down. Uh, they sold some. Uh, they kept a lot in Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, as a result, like the treasure of the Tesla Foundation has evolved over the year. Uh, I, yeah, I think in uh, by uh, by. Maybe uh, September, October, it's around like 1.5 billion or something wow. like that. So it, 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 it ballooned. Okay. So, but this sounds like, this sounds like the basically crypto dream, right? In terms of like, I mean, if you look just from the outside, right? Yeah. In terms of result, well, we put out this white paper, then like there is all this money raised, then it's always in Bitcoin kind of like at the right time. Okay, there is like maybe the summer it goes down a bit, but then it goes up like crazy into like in the billions. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds from the outside like the crypto dream. And then there's this story that happens with the the the, the president of the foundation. Yeah. What, what's the key learning from that? Don't do business with this guy. I, mean, I, I, I wish there were like something really deep to learn, you know, like some deep life experience, but like so much of it is just so idiosyncratic and you know, like like you said, a lot of things went right, but also a lot of things went wrong. And you know, it, it was not just this guy. So like a lot of things had to basically go wrong and align for this to uh, for this to to happen. 
right? Like, first of all, this guy had to be a psychopath. The, there was one director on the board who was instructed by the lawyers of the foundation. They says, like, you know, you have a legal duty to actually, like, vote to fire this guy. And he still decides to ignore the lawyer and to trust some other lawyers that's been, like, brought by the, 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 the crazy person. So, like, we had basically a two out of three failure in the mm -hmm. board of the, uh, of the Tesla Foundation. It's not one out of three. Two out of three failures, the lawyers also, like, get really, really sheepish around this time in, in, uh, in Switzerland because they know they've basically committed malpractice. They were also, you know, they never mentioned it, but they were the lawyers of the crazy guy that they mm. suggested. Uh, and they knew he was bankrupt. So there's a lot of, like, malpractice that happened from MME at the time. Uh, but there's also, like, and, and then, you know, there's lawsuits being filed. And so, like, it's busy. And, and it's, a, it's a perfect storm. Like, everyone wants, you know, to... Uh, to have their kind of like ICO story. Mm. And so much of it was dirty in the space. And so people just assume it's like, oh, it's it's probably just as bad. And so let's just like dig on him. And at the same time as well, there was there had been a lot of transparency. And so there's this massive transparency tax because for like very lazy wire reporters, it's easier to pick up on Tezos because there's more information. So they just go there. And you know, like after years of like lawyers go in and say like, it's going to be a slam dunk because these things are like, you know, so uh, 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 so loose and uh, and and and, and put it on. And yeah, after like years of trying to uh, to sue, they they don't actually like find anything because the thing is clean. But it's uh, so we, we we kind of paid for like a lot of the uh, like scandals who were mm -hmm. operating in the space. How did you personally leave this situation? So both at that moment where obviously like you have all these kind of like bad type of attention and also shortly after the market peaks mm. everything goes down and these swings you know you have just the swings in so, sort of like wealth net worth all these it's complete madness going up like crazy going down like crazy and then you have also this kind of aspect like how do you personally live this uh i mean the, the price swings were not really affect me that much it was it, it was more about the uh the constant public slandering was a bigger uh, was a bigger issue because I, I was I was thinking about like what was happening to me at the same you know at, at that time you know there's like the risk of bankruptcy everyone getting on, on us and so on and so forth and I'm thinking at the time it's like well this is really weird and really bad what's happening but at the same time you know like people get diagnosed with cancer every day mm. and getting cancer would be worse than this clearly mm. so you know is it that bad what's happening to me and what didn't occur to me until years later is like one key difference between what was happening to me and like getting things like a really bad medical diagnosis was a public eye. You know, one of the biggest differences, it's not just like I have these bad things happen to me in private. It was basically like the constant, uh, the constant slandering in the press was, uh, was pretty bad. What did, what did you do concretely with that? Did you I don't know, pick up meditation or like, did, or you just, how do you go through that? Ah, uh, on the mental health side of things. I mean, I guess one step at a time. Uh, and you know, the thing is, is like, it's a very, it was a very exogenous situation. I think at, uh, for a short period of time, I think I, uh, I took some anxiolytics. Okay. Uh, How did it help? It helped greatly, but like, I, I think it really varies. Like some people will get, like, I think they, they're quite addictive. Some people can get mm -hmm. addicted to them. So uh, I don't want to be a, a, a human billboard for, for anything like that. Mm -hmm. and, and they were prescribed by, uh, uh, by a doctor. But I was lucky enough that at the time, you know, like I took them for a short period of time. They were able to help. And then uh, I didn't have a problem not taking them after that. Did but it may be atypical. Like, I, I think, like, people can get very addicted to, uh, like, to depressants like this. Do you try some therapy? Have you ever tried? Yeah, yeah, over the years, like, on and off. Okay. What do you think of it? I think it really depends on the person. Uh, For you? I mean, yeah, I guess I can, I'm, I'm the only, uh, I can only speak to my experience. But, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, I would say the, the, it's positive effect, but it's moder moderate, moderately positive. Something else helped better? I don't know, sport, clean food, mm. get meditation, maybe, uh, or music? Yeah. Or just I, time? No, I think time. Uh, time. I mean, usually I've been like, I've tended to be a pretty happy person through, uh, through my life. So I, I tend to be pretty resilient to, uh, to these things. Mm. Uh, but it was a lot. What happened? What happened after that? So basically, 2018. There's a mega bear market. 
Like yeah. how much involved are you in the whole, like, okay, now we're going to bring this Tezos thing to the next level. Are you even able to concentrate on the future of Tezos when you're in the middle of this kind of storm? Nope. That's okay. <laughs> That's going to be bad. <laughs> yes. Until who, the who was? So who was focused on the future of Tezos when well, you kind of like the leaders are in the middle of this storm? There was an evil, like the, the board of the foundation like went from like evil uh, and actively trying to tank everything uh, to being well-meaning, but not very competent, uh, like in, 20, uh, in 2018. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, maybe even well-meaning is... Uh, is even nice, but at least you know, not actively hostile, uh, to just kind of passive, and uh, so the project was, uh, you know, like was what it was for 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 a couple of years, and I, I was mostly focused on like trying to uh, uh, trying to basically like recover. I was you know doing some uh, like, you know like some speaking, uh, mm -hmm. trying to uh, trying to talk to the community, trying to. Uh, match people with each other, uh, make introductions. Uh, and of course, you know, like the, the losses were quite time consuming. Mm -hmm. What are you guys focused on now? Well, uh, personally, I'm trying to, uh, uh, I'm trying to, uh, to help the Tezos ecosystem in a way that I can. So like now a difference from like the past is that I'm on the board of the Tezos Foundation. Mm -hmm. I'm also a director here in London in a, in a company called Trinitech that works on, uh, uh as part of, uh, uh, as a member of the ecosystem in helping, you know, grow the protocol, uh, grow adoption. So, you know, to the extent that I can uh, do that, I do a little bit of, uh, I do R&D. So I, uh, I've worked on some technical ideas for uh, for the development of Tezos, uh, basically a bit of representation, going to conferences and like talking about uh, evangelizing for, for, for Tezos um, and trying to help a little bit different entities in the ecosystem with a recruitment and like finding good um, uh, senior people. And I would say, Today, the priority is uh, like one for, you know, on the, on the Tizos Foundation side, for the Tizos Foundation to be on very sustainable ground. They have a very large treasury, but they've also increased spending a lot uh, in 2021. So it's gradually gone down, but it's important to ensure that they are. I would say it's a different market now. There was a time where it was like, hey, if this spending can help the Tizos protocol, it's a good idea because right now there's just like not enough stuff happening and an excess of treasury. Whereas now it's a lot more like budget driven, saying like, okay, what's the budget for this year? Mm -hmm. How much you know can uh, how much can can be granted into like this type of area, this type of area, uh, and also trying. So I would say Tezos is very successful as a technical project. It's probably one of the best technology that's out there, uh, but it needs to have more success on the adoption side. Mm. It's found like a great and very fertile ground of, uh, of adoption um, in the art space. Mm. Uh, among generative yeah. artists, it's been absolutely yeah. beautiful. Uh, but we need we need more seeds like this growing in the uh, Tezos ecosystem. So one of the things that's really interesting is like, especially in crypto, it's so volatile and crazy being an investor, an entrepreneur, that obviously is not good for mental health, physical health, right? Mm. And people in the space and also entrepreneurs in general who go through these really intense times of building a company try to think about how can I kind of like optimize my brain or my body to like function better? Yeah. Have you done some things like that in, in sort of biohacking space? Yeah, I've tried to do things over the years. Uh, not much has like much of an effect, you know, like in terms of like, I've never been on. I, I, I've tried everything, you know, I've, I've been on carnivore diets, keto diets, all, all, all of the different types of diet. I've tried all types of supplements and, and all of that. The like cognitively easy, the, 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 the main thing that, that makes a difference is like get, one is getting enough sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Back to the basics. <laughs> it's like, you know, <laughs> people won't do, people will take like, will try like weird cognitive enhancers and not get enough sleep. And like, this makes a big difference. Mm. <laughs> so it's just like getting enough sleep, uh, and, and I know that, you know, like I mentioned, like ketogenic diets, carnivore diets, I know that for some, for some people it makes a huge difference. Like, feel, and especially like people who have certain, certain like conditions being like uh, 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 depression, for example, like that can make very big differences to them. But it's, it's not a case for me. Like I don't really get a, a difference uh, from it. I, uh, and I remember getting into this like, like what, 15 years ago. And trying like, oh, maybe, you know, like piracetam and paracetam and all this stuff can do something. And it's just like not, barely does anything. 
the one thing that I've like that 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 I've uh, that I've read that actually has an effect is you know like stimulants in general. Uh, For example, uh, you know like uh, amphetamines or okay. uh, or uh, or modafinil. Uh, okay. Clearly, they have a cognitive effect. What's the cost uh, or the downside of that? Afterwards, the downside of it. I mean, I and have. First, what's the experience? I've tried. On it? I've tried amphetamines in my life, and like I, I've never like taken them regularly at uh, uh, at any point. Um, I think you know the, the downsides are known. You know, they, I would say like they, they raise your heart rate, they raise your blood pressure uh, when they happen. Um, they can be addictive. Uh, yeah, you know, people like crash after uh, after using them. I mean, there's clearly a time and a place for them. Like, I don't know if you are in uh, in the trenches and it's you know like uh, and you have to like raid the other side. Would you take amphetamines before doing it or not? And yeah, of course, yes. You yeah. know, you'll deal with a crash later. Right now, what matters is this. Yeah. Same thing if you had like a really, really high stake exam, for example. Like, you know, there, there's circumstances where it all makes sense. Uh, and, you know, please don't, if you're watching this, don't do anything without talking to a doctor. Um, Modafinil is different. Uh, it doesn't seem to have as much bodily, eff like bodily effect. And, and its effects also vary widely around people. It's not exactly understood how it works. Mm. It seems to be safe. Uh, like people have OD'd on caffeine, people have not OD'd on modafinil, even though people have tried. Mm. So the safety profile is actually like better than caffeine. The side effects are better than caffeine. The main downside with modafinil is that it has a very long half life, mm. and so basically it can be make it hard to uh, to go to sleep. If you know if you're going to be like up for, if I think it's like a half life of twelve hours or something like that. So it's uh, it's not great. And then if your sleep schedule gets 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 you know screwed up, then then the result is worse. So the, the world still awaits for the creation of something like modafinil with like a, a half-life of like four or five hours, mm. which actually exists. It's like a, there's an enantiomer of modafinil, which actually does that. It's just not commercialized. But you had access to it? No, no, no. Okay. Well, I mean, it's hard <laughs> to, pre like you will have to produce it and so forth. It's not even, it's, it's not even being produced. So back to the basics, basically it's sleep, exercise, Diet. I mean, a decent diet. And People say that about exercise. I haven't noticed that it makes a difference for me. But the diet. You said you lost fifty pounds. I did. I lost fifty, I lost 50 How pounds. How do you do here. that? And I'm, I'm very happy with it, but I, I don't think it makes a difference in my mental clarity. I'm happier in the mirror. I, mm. I feel like I have a bit more energy, but it's not like uh, it's not like oh my god, I'm getting this mental clarity all of a sudden. But it might make a difference on your life. Yeah, no, it, it's it's, it's good. It's a, it's a positive difference. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What do you think about uh, the longevity space? You said you spent yeah a lot of time studying that, right? I did. I, uh, I you know I fell into that rabbit hole as well. There doesn't seem to be all much that can be done in terms of longevity uh, and, and, and supplements. Again, you know, with the caveat of like medical blah blah blah. I think some people get benefits from metformin. Mm. Uh, at least they are. Well, I mean, definitely diabetic people get benefits from metformin, but I mean, people have been taking it for longevity. Like, there's maybe some indication that it does something. I for a while I took uh, what's it called, uh, resveratrol. That was a big thing in uh, in 2010. What is that? Resveratrol. Uh, it was this. I don't know. It was this molecule that was supposed like, and if you give it to rats, apparently they live longer. But then there were monkey studies that showed no benefits. I, the, the thing is, like, a lot of very short-lived species, like like rats or flies, you can extend their lives pretty well mm. uh, and then it doesn't translate into longer leaf species and it happens very often and it was a case for resveratrol like it was lots of promise like oh it makes fasting and all of this and like even calorie restriction like for large for larger organism doesn't seem to do all that much so would you go as far as saying that all these um, kind of longevity experts I mean a lot of experts online but like it's more of a marketing thing to kind of almost make money out of it rather than an actual proven thing. Because the, cl the clear example is, I'm following a few of these guys about longevity, and it's always the same dudes out there talking about that. And every year, they yeah. change their 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 mind. Because there is new, so they justify it by, ah, I have new information now, yeah. which is why. But it makes it like very hard to kind of believe, you know, like, hey, like, I mean, and also like, as you said, everybody's different, right? And if everybody's different, especially with regarding diet and everything, like, there's not this one thing you can do, everybody can do to extend their life or become healthier. Everybody's different, so everybody yeah. should try all that stuff. And at the end of the day, the more, the more you try, the more you get lost, the more should you not just like look at the basics again, like did I sleep enough? Do I feel good today? And instead of going down, because you said you went down to this rabbit hole, but they kind of like came out without concrete 
answers, right? Well, I mean, you know, I, I did come up with an answer. The answer it was like, there's not, there's not, there's, there's probably nothing that really works. <laughs> that was the, uh, that was the main, that was the main answer. Is there, uh, <laughs> is there another big topic that you went down the rabbit hole and came out saying there's not really an answer? Or there's nothing really anything working. Uh, <laughs> Uh, human morality. I, I went into a big uh, mm. moral philosophy rabbit hole, uh, and uh, do you want to develop on that? Y yeah. So <laughs> I, I got interested into uh, I would say libertarian political philosophy, starting around like two thousand five, two thousand six, maybe a little earlier than that, and then it got me interested into um, the ontology and like you know you you're looking at something like this, and I was like taking. Uh, a very natural rights approach to it. And then you think about the ontology and then you say like, well, what is the underpinning of like ethics anyway? Uh, and then you'll find different theories and, uh, you know, utilitarian theories, the ontology theories, there is a virtue and all of that. Um, and then you are going to like basically hit the uh, is odd problem at some point. It's like, well, you know, the, you can't really have uh, a positive account for, for, for morality. It is what it is, but there's no... And, The weirdest thing is when people say like this is what morality should be. <laughs> it, it it shouldn't be anything, you know. It it, it, is, it is what it is, but it, the notion that it should be something is like you you can't make a normative judgment about a normative system, right? So, um, it's, uh, my, my 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 conclusion is that like fundamentally, it's uh, morality is a, is, is a type of preference that we have. Like you know, uh, we don't experience it the same way as. Uh, I don't experience. I don't experience my desire to act morally in the same way that I experience my desire to, uh, to you know, to get sugar or uh, or other things. But just because I don't experience it the same way, it doesn't mean that it's not fundamentally uh, a preference. Like there are preferences largely shaped by evolution, but as a result, I think that the main insight is like you can't say that those preferences are wrong. Like people who say like, oh, you know, we have what we have is some intuition of an external system. That's that's. That's that's actually the valid one. You can't do that. You need to ground it on something, and and the best thing you can ground it on is human intuition. So you end up with some like I would say an underwhelming view of ethics because you don't have a grand system to uh, to explain uh, all of it and say like well this is what you should do in life. No, it's just like it's a messy set of uh, of human preferences who will vary among humans and will vary a little bit among cultures, but broadly speaking, they tend in the same direction. Do you think it's possible to? be to act in a very kind of morally correct way in business and be extremely successful uh yeah i think so uh, i think a lot of people have been uh i think a lot of people have been very successful in business while being uh while being moral actors i mean i would say different people with with different views on ethics might might disagree with that um mm. uh, i think it's um uh, I, I do think it happens. I, I, I do think an ethical behavior in business happens, definitely. Uh, I think the trope of saying like, "Oh, I'm not successful because I'm not doing all the uh, mm. all the analytical stuff that everyone is doing" is just scope. Like, 99% of the time, it's scope excuse. Okay. as a complete yeah. excuse. However, I also think it's I, you know like it's, it's generally not said by people who are like 90% as successful as the other people. Uh, but I also do think that yeah, I, I would say like if if you are. Uh, So basically, you have, you have two possibilities. One is that it's never an advantage to do something, you know, immoral. Like, morality is always in your advantage. And if you do something immoral, you're making, like, a business mistake. And that seems like it would be extremely hard to believe that that would be the case, right? To, to believe in karma? No. I mean, not... Because it's linked. Not, <laughs> like, if I do something bad now, like, karma is going to yeah, kind yeah. of punish me later in business, for example. You no, know, I don't like believe in karma. I don't believe in karma, but I, I do believe that... I do believe in the fact that like we have moral preferences because they serve a purpose. Like evolutionarily, for example, you have the preference, you know, like you don't want to betray people. You don't, you don't want to betray other people. And the reason is like, because you're, otherwise you'll be tempted. You might say like, well, I, I won't betray because I know that it's my interest. It's in my self-interest to be perceived as a non-betraying person. And as a result, I'm just not going to betray people. Not because I don't want to betray them, but because it would hurt my reputation. But in practice, that requires a lot of cognitive overload, and evolutionarily, it's more stable to just have a preference not to betray, right? And so the question is, like, when people think that they're being, like, a little clever and say, like, ah, you know, I, uh, I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to, like, betray on this deal. Well, 
it, it does, they do end up like having a bad reputation. And so there's a wisdom uh, that exists in moral rules that can be lost when people break them. It's, it's a whole, like, it's a whole plot of, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, crime and punishment, right? That's, uh, I don't want to spoil the book, <laughs> but it's been out for a while. But it's someone, you know, it's uh, the, the main character essentially like doesn't, says like, look, fundamentally, like, is it, is it, you know, becomes a nihilist and says, look, like Essek is not grounded, grounded in, uh, in, in, in anything, goes out, commits a murder and then realizes like, oh no, I feel bad about this now. Uh, and, and I have all this, uh, all this problem. So yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a, I, I think it's a case that a lot of people who like will try to behave unethically or like try to get an advantage from behaving unethically are probably fooling themselves and are probably going to hurt themselves. But at the same time, it would be fantastically unlikely that the best possible court of action in, in, in the business would be to be always 100% ethical. So if you take a pick of like the most successful businesses, it would also be unlikely that there was nothing unethical uh, happening. That may, I don't know if that makes sense. It does. It yeah. does. Why do you think, do you think that crypto attracts unethical people? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like most of the Why? Them, uh, and obviously, I want to, there is the, the prospects of easy money in general, because there is the trial of uh, Sam Bankman Fried now. So it's yeah. basically like, I, I want to come to that because the, so the, because the, there is this crazy example, especially last year of what happened, yeah, where yeah. you would think the dude is like in front of the Congress, he's like the kind of like God almost, it, and we're thinking like this dude is like bringing us, you know, towards mass adoption and people understanding us, etc. And then this stuff happened. Yeah, pretty bad person. Uh, and this is this is a typical example of like actually you know like uh, so I don't know to which extent this, this is sincerity right but the guy at least represented himself as like some bentimist utilitarian and you could still like conceive a story of saying like well I did all these unethical things because I plan on giving the money and saving all these mm. people and so you know ethically it makes sense yeah. I don't I don't even believe that but even arguendo let's say there was a case he still failed at this. Uh, and it was also he was also bound to fail. This is not a case of like him rolling the die. He was going to get caught, you know, like just stealing customer deposits. That was not that was not a uh, that was not a business he could get out of. There was no way to cash out. The fraud was not sophisticated enough for that. So this is this would be a good example of like someone thinking they can get an edge uh, by not act acting deontologically and fooling themselves. What would you tell your 19 years old self if you met him today? Uh, we can't do stock tips, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, uh, it's so hard because there's just like, there's just so many things, like so many very small things that can completely transform my, uh, transform the life. But if I try to, uh, to answer the spirit of the, of the question as best I can, um, like if I if I'm given like the the type of generic advice I would give someone like like nineteen year old uh, take more risk early on uh, take more risk early on in your twenties. Do you think you did you did so? I didn't take any risk. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Take so more risk early, early on in your twenties because your opportunity cost is much lower. Do you think it's easier to say that when you've been really successful? Uh, no, because it's something that I also realized I should have done before being successful. Could have been, and also I, could, I, 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 and also like I could have presented a good argument for it, even even without success. Because the whole point is like you know, if you let's say you try entrepreneurship like in your early twenties and you try it for like three or four year, three years and it fails, you know, you've lost like three years of your of, of compensation as like a junior employee, mm -hmm. and you've gained like a lot of experience, which is re relevant anyway. Absolutely. So really, like your the option value of doing that is very high. Was the moment someone should stop trying? And this is like this is not you know, assuming you uh, assuming you can afford to do that, which is not necessarily everyone. Maybe like some maybe you have responsibilities like uh, like people you need to take care of and so on and so forth. That's not necessarily for everyone. But you know, if you have the possibility of of trying that, it's definitely worth it. When do you stop trying if you're not successful? You know, consistently not successful. Um, that I don't know because there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there. You know. One entrepreneur. Yeah, one entrepreneur. Oh, want, so want or yeah. one? <laughs> want or one? Want. One entrepreneur. Well, the thing is, like, don't be a want entrepreneur. Be a entrepreneur or, <laughs> or not. Just don't be a want. <laughs> amazing. That was amazing. Thank you so much, man, for your Thanks time. Thanks for having me. Thank you.